Good morning and welcome everyone to our first webinar for 2023, Employment Law Changes, What Every Business and HR Team Needs to Know, which is proudly supported by Matthews Folbig Lawyers, our longest standing member at WSBC. It is great to have so many people online and I'm sure you are going to find today's webinar very informative. My name's Brendan Noni. I'm the president of the Western Sydney Business Connection. Before we begin, I acknowledge that I'm hosting and recording this webinar from the lands of the Bidjigal people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. The Connection is proud to be partnering with 11 incredible businesses to ensure you continue to have access to webinars like the one today at little or no cost. And I'd like to thank Matthews Folby Lawyers, Campbelltown City Council, City of Parramatta, Commonwealth Bank, Hitachi, KPMG Australia, MySkills Australia, NEC, NICAS Australia, Parramatta Leagues Club and World Class Teams. Today's webinar will be presented by Daniel Imingen from Matthews Folby Lawyers. Daniel was admitted as a solicitor of the Supreme Court of New South Wales in 2021 after graduating from Western Sydney University with degrees in law and commerce. Following his admission as a solicitor, Daniel initially practised in insurance and workers' compensation law, representing both federal government and self-insured private sector clients in matters litigated before the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Utilising his degrees, Daniel currently practises in employment law, providing timely and practical advice to businesses across the broad range of matters that employers encounter. It's my pleasure to welcome today's presenter, Daniel Imingen. Um, over to you, Daniel. Thank you for that introduction, Brendan. And I'm pleased to be here today presenting on what I think is a really relevant and topical matter. Um, I'll just share my slides. Moment. So as I said, the, today's topic, as Brendan mentioned, is about the recent federal government's reforms on employment relations. Um, there's obviously been a significant level of interest in these reforms, um, which I think is because they present some of the biggest changes in this area for some time, and they affect employers of all sizes. Given some of the time constraints today, I'll only be covering these topics, which I think are most relevant to the people in our audience today. Um, You'll probably notice that I'll start off by providing a brief background on each of these topics and then proceed to outline the reforms before finally mentioning some practical tips that employers can do in response to the changes. So today's discussion centers around pay secrecy clauses in employment contracts and workplace policies, sexual harassment in the workplace, the expansion of the general protections regime, the use of fixed term contracts and the changes in that area, uh, flexible working arrangements, which I'm sure we'll all know, the famous example being work from home. And then finally, I'll touch on some future reforms that the federal government's flagged it may make this year and beyond. Um, I should say at the outset that at a high level, the government considers these reforms will foster gender equality, improve transparency, increase job security, and result in wages growth. Uh, the reason I mention these ambitious objectives is, is because the areas of reform need to be considered in that light, and they provide some helpful clues about future directions of the reforms coming up. So with that introduction out of the way, I'll move on to our first topic, which is pay secrecy, personal favourite of mine. Pay secrecy clauses are typically found in employment contracts, workplace policies, as well as confidentiality deeds, for example, in the case of an employee departing from their employment. They essentially require an employee to keep their pay information or related information confidential from others, particularly their colleagues. It's also relevant in a salary review context because sometimes, either verbally or informal documents, an employee is asked to keep changes to their salary confidential from others. Breaching pay secrecy clauses has often resulted in disciplinary action for employees, up to including dismissal. As you can see, I've included a, an example, a recent example of this in play in the case of Primo Foods. To provide a, to provide a brief background of that decision, Primo successfully defended a general protections claim brought by a former employee whose employment it had terminated 
for breaching its pay secrecy requirements. For context, Primo had been in the process of negotiating new salaries for its employees, and it expressly told each of the employees it met with to keep that information confidential. Despite being told to do so, the employee in question asked his colleagues about their pay offers and also communicated his colleagues' pay offers to others in the workplace and then shared this with the HR representative in charge of the negotiations. Prima's main concern seemed to be that sharing this information without context would undermine and delay its salary review efforts, particularly because the offers reflected more than just the numbers of hours the employees worked. It also they also took into account the employees' qualifications and years of experience. So communicated with that context, it, it clearly had the prospect of causing workplace disharmony. The court in that case ultimately accepted that these were good reasons for keeping the salary offer information confidential and dismissed the employee's claim. Turning now to what's changed in this area. The recent reforms mean that pay secrecy clauses will be unlawful, invalid and unenforceable from 7 December 2022, only in respect of those contracts that were entered into after that date. So for example, if you've got an employment contract after that date that's been entered into, if you try to discipline an employee or rely in any way on pay secrecy clause, um, including because they've shared the information when they weren't supposed to, um, it would be difficult to defend a disciplinary action if it came to an unfair dismissal claim. Additionally, from 7 June this year, penalties will, will apply to employers who include pay secrecy clauses in their contracts which were entered into or varied after 7 December 2022. Finally, there's also a workplace right that employees now have to share or not share their remuneration information, which includes their other information that's relevant to working out their, their pay, including their hours and days of work. This has some really important implications from a general protection perspective, which I'll be discussing in greater detail later in this podcast. Pay secrecy clauses entered into before 7 December 2022, that is before the changes came into effect, will continue to be effective and won't attract penalties from June this year until those contracts are varied. Now, it's important to note that a variation could include, for example, a change to pay or change to position. So, as you'll see, it's important to keep on top of these. In terms of practical tips, before I move on to that, I think it's important to say that the pay secrecy reforms, in my view, present a good opportunity for employers to have a think about what goes into their, their pay determinations. So whether it's prevailing market rates, experience, performance, and so on. Because by being able to think about these considerations, employers will be in a better position to explain and address questions from employees about pay differences. Another opportunity for employers from these reforms is to proactively publish general pay information to employees to limit the prospect of misinformation in the workplace about pay. Um, clearly this information has the prospect of causing workplace disharmony. So it's better to be out on the front foot and actively communicating with employees and ensuring that you're part of the conversation. In my view, employers who are unprepared to explain pay differences particularly between employees performing the same role, uh, will likely experience decreased employee morale as well as higher turnover potentially. Turning now to what you can do from a practical perspective, we recommend that employers review and amend existing contracts to ensure that no pay secrecy clauses are in place. Now, I think it's a good idea to do this even if you've got an employment contract which is entered into before the changes took into effect. Because if you have a change down the line to that employee's position or you try to use the same contract template by accident, for instance, that could give rise to a contravention of the act and potential re legal risks in other areas as well. So it's better to be safe than sorry and be proactive in making these changes to both current and existing contracts. Our next topic today relates to sexual harassment in the workplace. Now, I've included a legal definition here of sexual harassment, and that is essentially including two limbs. The first limb requires that the individual who is allegedly engaged in harassment engaged in the conduct described in paragraphs A or B, 
And, they, and the second limb involves considering whether that conduct was engaged in circumstances in which a reasonable person, which we've highlighted, um, having regard to all of the circumstances, would have anticipated the possibility that the person allegedly harassed would be offended, humiliated, or intimidated. It's a little bit of a wordy definition. So in the next slide, I've included, and this comes directly from the legislation, um, the factors that are relevant to consider the circumstances, because obviously context is important. So some of the factors, and I'm not going to list all of them, um, include the relationship between the person harassed and the person who engaged in the alleged harassment, as well as the attributes or disability of the person harassed and any other relevant circumstance. So you can see it's very broad and each case needs to be considered in, in light of its context, the workplace and the relationship between the parties. Turning now to what's changed, and I'm sure most of you have heard of the most prominent change, which is the new positive duty that employers have from 6th of March, which is coming a lot sooner than I thought, um, to take all reasonable and proportionate measures to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace. So essentially, as a result of this change, employers need to be taking a more proactive approach in eliminating this conduct and behavior in the workplace. This is in contrast to what some consider to be a more reactive approach in the past, which involved merely investigating conduct and taking action after it occurred. So although that remedial action is still important and has a role to play, the government has made it clear through its reforms that the real emphasis is now on preventative measures and active stamping out of this behaviour. It's worth noting, and this is a particularly important point, that the positive duty to eliminate sexual harassment operates concurrently with employers, WHS, and other obligations under various legislation. So this means that while the proactive duty is new, the obligations to stamp out sexual harassment aren't really that different from what was in the past under the workers and safety legislation just means that there's more an, an emphasis on it. Essentially, another thing that that means is that sexual harassment in the workplace could give rise to investigations or legal action by not only the safety regulator, but also the Australian Human Rights Commission, as well as by the employee in question. Turning now to how sexual harassment complaints are managed on a, on a practical level. Essentially, it starts off by a complaint being made to the Human Rights Commission who then manages the complaints, including by facilitating, facilitating a conciliation. If that's unsuccessful, the Human Rights Commission will terminate the complaint and then the employee or the representative, usually a union, can then decide to initiate federal court proceedings. Now, these can have big implications, including some of the remedies I've listed out below in the slide. So for example, it can result in a declaration that the unlawful discrimination has occurred and a direction for the employer not to repeat or continue the unlawful discrimination. It can also result in an order requiring an employer to re-employ a complainant or pay compensation. So there clearly are a number of risks involved with this behaviour. Which brings us to the next part, which essentially lines up what, the, what, the, what we think are the biggest risks from sexual harassment. Although we can agree that this behaviour is unacceptable and has no, work, no place in the workplace, you can see from this slide that it also presents significant financial, reputational and health risks to all those in the workplace. So some examples include reduced proactivity, increased employee turnover, reputational harm and an increase in workers' compensation claims. Each of these adverse outcomes has flow-on effects for everyone involved in the workplace. As an example, an increase in workers' compensation claims can lead to higher insurance premiums, which in turn affects an employer's financial position, and then ultimately affects spending and hiring decisions. So you can see that this, there's a strong motivation for employers from all perspectives to take this new proactive approach. Naturally, what employers do in response to these reforms needs to be appropriate having regard to the context of their workplace, because no two workplaces are the same. As an example, Christmas parties and work gathering involving alcohol should be closely monitored and managed, including by setting clear expectations to employees about what appropriate behaviour is, and by considering offering 
non-alcoholic or low alcohol content drinks. We know that out of hours conduct has been found to have a connection to employment in the past. And so these functions, while beneficial for a number of reasons, including to unwind at the end of the year, carry significant risk for employers and employees. We recommend employers ensure that all employees, particularly managers, are aware of the new obligations, including by providing regular training, which allows them to recognize, report, and ultimately help eliminate sexual harassment in the workplace. Training materials and policies in this area need to be continuously updated to reflect workplace feedback and data. And that's where the proactive part comes in, because you're looking at your data and taking a data-driven approach to the issue. Um, employers should also monitor sexual harassment complaints and take timely and appropriate remedial actions. Finally, we recommend that employers test employees' understanding of sexual harassment policies and training materials to ensure that everyone's on the same page about the workplace expectations and the required action under the law. Moving on to our next topic, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, the general protections regime, very topical. Um, the general protections regime essentially prohibits an employer from taking what's called adverse action against an employee because of the exercise of workplace right or for a discriminatory reason. Adverse action isn't just limited to terminating an employee's employment, but can also include things like demoting an employee or changing their pay. There are a few distinguishing characteristics about the general protections regime, especially when compared to the unfair dismissal regime. Firstly, there's a reverse onus of proof, which is very beneficial to employees in this context because it requires the employer to demonstrate that their reason for taking the adverse action against the employee didn't relate to a prohibited reason, i.e. discrimination or the exercise of workplace right. So they could point to performance and other issues. An employer will find it difficult to discharge this onus if one of the reasons for the adverse action included a prohibited reason, which I've just mentioned, even if there were valid reasons as well for the adverse action, such as poor conduct or performance. Another key feature is that compensation isn't limited in the same way as an unfair dismissal regime. So in that regime, it's limited to 26 weeks remuneration or half of the high income threshold. Um, so, general, so the liability for general protections claims can be much higher. And finally, employers can be liable for pecuniary penalties. In light of the decision of the High Court last year in Patterson, uh, the value of, of penalties imposed on employers for breaches of the Fair Work Act can be expected to be higher because the previously regarded proportionality of the conduct is no longer relevant, only objective and general deterrence and circumstances. So we expect penalties to increase. Moving on to what's changed in this area. The reforms to general protections regime include putting gender identity, breastfeeding and intersex status as protected attributes, which is relevant in adverse action claims involving discrimination. As well as, as I mentioned earlier, in the pay secrecy context, um, clarifying that an employee's choice to disclose or refuse to disclose their remuneration information is a workplace right. These changes essentially broaden the types of general protections claims which can be brought by employees. In terms of what employers can do in response to the changes, uh, we recommend employers obviously avoid taking adverse action either directly or indirectly because of the protected attributes or, a decision, or an employee's decision to disclose or refuse to disclose their information about pay. Um, the best way to ensure that compliance with the new changes takes place is again to provide appropriate training to management and other decision makers uh, in relation to these changes, because ultimately their evidence is very important in, in discharging that reverse onus of proof that I mentioned in this context. Finally, relevant policies should be updated to reflect the changes. So for example, removing pay secrecy items from policies uh, and training and the training materials as well in relation to this to managers should be updated. Moving now to our next topic, uh, which is changes to the fixed term contracts. Um, as you can see, fixed term contracts 
offer a number of benefits for employers, um, particularly those with project-based or seasonal demands. They promote certainty from a financial perspective for employers because they know the start and end date of their employees' employment, and it helps them plan and manage their workforce accordingly. The changes to the fixed term contracts regime happen from 7 December this year. And they essentially make it unlawful for an employer to engage an employee under a fixed term contract if that contract is for a period longer than two years, or if it could be extended or renewed for a period extending two years, or if it could be renewed and extended more than once. It also requires employers when engaging employees under a fixed term contract to provide what's called a, a copy of the fixed term contract information statement, which I believe can be found on the Fair Work website. Now it's important to note as usual with the law that exceptions do apply to the changes. So before you go out and rush to change your contract, you should consider those exceptions, particularly with legal advice. Some of the changes which need to be considered include, for example, if the renewed or extended contract for the employee relates to substantially different duties or a substantially different role, because in that case, it's not really a renewal and therefore isn't captured by the new changes. Another thing is whether the contract in the first year exceeded the high income threshold, which is currently $160,000, because if it exceeded that, then the changes don't apply. Finally, where a modern award covering an employee permits the use, ongoing use of fixed term contracts, that will also not be a contravention. There's a long list of other exceptions which you should carefully consider. In terms of what employers can do in, in light of these changes, and in terms, sorry, what these changes mean, the changes essentially mean that contract clauses contravening the new requirements will be unlawful, invalid, and unenforceable. So that means essentially that relying on these clauses will be of no use to an employer where they're in contravention. And in fact, will expose the employer to legal and other risks. Second, breaching the requirements may result in significant penalties, which as I mentioned in the general protections context, we expect to increase moving forward. Thirdly and finally, relying on an invalid fixed term contract clause in an employee's contract to end their employment can give rise to the risk of an unfair dismissal claim. Now, while employers have some time before these changes take effect, um, as with most things, we recommend that you take a proactive approach because it's better to take that type of approach rather than try and fix an issue once it's come about. So as a first step, uh, assuming none of the exceptions apply, which you need to consider carefully in light of your workplace, uh, employers should review existing contracts and remove provisions relating to the extension or renewal of a fixed term contract, which are inconsistent with the reforms. Employers should conduct an audit of current employees too to identify all employees who might be affected and will no longer be eligible for an extension or renewal of their contract. Following this review, employers need to have a long think about what lawful arrangements should be made to either continue or conclude these employment relationships in light of the changes. So for instance, offering a different type of employment which isn't a fixed term contract, if you'd like to keep those employees on. Finally, in terms of workplace planning, employers should think about what types of employment they'll offer in the future at a general level. So whether fixed term contracts still work for your business. I'll now turn to our last reform topic for today, which is flexible working arrangements, which I think will continue to be more and more topical as, as flexible work becomes the norm. Um, essentially, a flexible working arrangement allows employees with at least 12 months continuous service with an employer to request changes to their working arrangements if specific criteria, for example, relating to advanced age or caring responsibilities are met. The changes requested typically relate to working hours or the location of work. So an example which, with which we're all familiar, I'm sure, is working from home. So that's an example of a flexible working request, which typically comes up. The recent reforms essentially at a broad level limit an employer's capacity to reject a flexible working arrangement 
and impose a number of consultation requirements as well. The circumstances in which flexible working arrangements can be made has also been broadened to include where an employee or their immediate family experiences family or domestic violence. So as you can see on the slide, this change complements the recent introduction of 10 days family and domestic violence leave for employers, with smaller business, small business employers being affected from August 2023 this year. Finally, the reforms expose employers to liability for a breach of the national employment standards if they fail to follow the new consultation requirements or other requirements, or if they refuse to or if they refuse a flexible working arrangement request for reasons other than reasonable business grounds. Now th that last bit is significant because in the past, um, an employer's reasonable business grounds specifically couldn't be challenged as a breach of, a, of the national employment standards. It was specifically excluded. Now, again, although the, there is some time before these reforms take effect, we recommend a proactive approach. So that includes having a look at your internal processes um, which deal with these types of requests and making the necessary updates, particularly around consultation. If a request is too costly or impractical to implement, employers should be prepared to consider what arrangements they would accommodate in the workplace. Finally, employers should carefully consider whether there are reasonable business grounds for refusing such a request before doing so and ensure that it's done within 21 days and made after consultation and alternative arrangements have been considered. So with that, that concludes our discussion of the current reforms. And I'm sure there, there are many more that have come up in the last year. Um, um, I'll now turn to the future directions, which I briefly highlighted at the beginning of the presentation. Um, looking ahead, now nobody knows exactly what form these reform items will take. But based on what's been communicated in the media and other outlets, uh, these are the main changes which I think are most significant to employers, which we're looking at. So the first one is the introduction of employee-like rights for gig economy workers, which could include things like leave entitlements, workers' compensation, and minimum wages. So that's significant in light of uh, recent cases in this area. Um, dealing with, you know, what is characterised as an independent contractor, because in the past, the, in recent times, the High Court's really put an emphasis on the employment contract itself, as opposed to the conduct of the parties, particularly where it's written down. So I think the federal government sees that there's room for changes in this area, um, and it will be interesting to see how that plays out in light of the High Court's decision last year and how it will change it. So big changes happening in that area. The second one, which I think has been fairly contentious um, based on some employees' responses in the media is um, essentially requiring employers to pay labor hire employees uh, the same pay as direct employees they employ if they perform the same job. So this is very relevant to employers who have labor hire employees, obviously. So those employees in the mining, um, context in particular use lots of labor employees um, and I think the rationale here goes back to what I mentioned as one of the federal government's objectives for the current reforms which is job security and wages growth so those two things um, they're really targeting by the first two reforms that I've mentioned um, the third thing that's been mentioned quite a bit in in current years in recent years is this concept of wage theft, um, and I put that in quotation marks because it doesn't seem to be a real um, consistency on what people think is wage theft. So if you ask um, one person or another, they'll, they'll probably characterize differently. So the definition of what will be criminal behavior under the reforms will be very important. And I'll be watching that very closely in particular, because for example, would it capture um, only serious and systemic conduct, which is intentional? Or will it extend to things like recklessness? Um, will it extend to cases where an employer has, you know, through no fault of their own and because of difficulty keeping across with a myriad of um, employment relations instruments and modern awards and EBAs um, in that context, if they've had a bit of an oversight and corrected it and been proactive, will that be impacted by this change? 
So it's it's very important that we keep across that change and and um, see how those developments work out because it's obviously an important issue to a lot of employees and employers. Um, and the final thing that I've mentioned is amending the definition of a casual employee in the Fair Work Act. So that's something that's been flagged um, in recent times. There's been some changes in 2021 in this area um, to the legislation, but that those changes essentially required um, the courts to have a close look at what was the contract entered into at the beginning. So there wasn't really much of an emphasis as in the past um, on the co party's conducts moving forward and how that affected casual employees and whether someone's a casual or a permanent. There were some cases as well um, about this issue, similarly to independent contractors where, you know, employees who had been working the same shift or similar shifts for a long period of time um, then claimed that they weren't casual employees at all and they were in, in effect uh, permanent employees entitled to all the entitlements that they could get under those under that characterization, such as leave. So that's very important and something that I would be taking a close look at as developments happen. With those future reforms discussed and the presentation concluded, um, I'll now um, put this slide up just to show you exactly how it can help you today. So we primarily act for employers and we can assist with all aspects of employment law, so including litigated and not litigated matters. So that's everything from in updating and reviewing your existing employment agreements, policies, and the like, um, providing practical guidance to you about these reforms, um, as well as defending unfair dismissals, general protections claim, um, and underpayment claims, which we know come up very regularly. Uh, we can also help you ensure that your contracts are consistent with the reforms um, and your policies as well, and to respond to many questions from your employees about the disputes as and when they arise. And I'm sure there'll be many questions even after today's presentation from them. Um, I'm gonna take some questions about the reforms, if anyone has any. Back on. Back on. Um, well, that's um, we have some questions already. So, um, um, what I might do is um, maybe I'll just cross straight to the questions, um, given we've got a little bit of time to go. So, I'm just having a look in the webinar chat. So, I'll go to the very top and um, Helene Atkinson asks, uh, we're in the medical research sector with most of our employees on fixed term contracts due to funding for research. Funding is typically for a limited time or may be withdrawn. How do we work around this? Daniel. That's actually a very interesting question. And I think, um, and I'm sorry in advance for my answer not being specific enough, but I think this is one of those questions which definitely requires a little closer consideration. Um, about your workplace to see whether any of those exceptions apply. Because as I mentioned, there are quite a few of them. I only went through some of the exceptions in that, in, in light of those reforms. Um, so it definitely requires specific advice, I think. And I'm sorry, I won't be able to answer that one. Um, but my contact details are included in these slides and I'm happy to share them with you if you'd like us to take a closer look at that issue. Yes, and I will let everyone know that there are a copy, there will be a copy of the slides that will be sent around post this webinar. Um, so the next question I've got here is from Camilla, where can we find a full list of exceptions for fixed term contracts? So that would be in the, because those changes have some times to come into effect, you'd need to look at the uh, the bill that was passed. So the, they're actually included there. If you'd like, we'd be happy to provide a, a copy of that to you in PDF form or a link. Um, I don't have the link handy on me at the moment, but it's, it's definitely widely available um, on the federal government's legislation website. Okay, there we go. Um, the next question I have here, uh, it's from Marilyn. Jake, currently casuals 
get a 25% loading, which is in lieu of uh, leave, so uh, sick leave, annual leave. With this new paid domestic leave obligation, how does that work? That's an interesting one. I'd need to give this one a little bit more thought, I'm sorry, because those changes are very new. Um, as I understand it, the changes, the family and domestic violence leave changes, there's some requirements about how that leave is recorded um, and some further changes to happen there. So that, that could have been a whole topic on its own. Um, there are specific requirements about how those are recorded in pay slips um, and how that time is treated. But I would say at a high level, I'm happy to come back to you on that question because it is a good question, but it's just not something that was in, included in today's presentation. So I'm happy for you to email me and I can respond to you about that. Yeah, it's probably a little bit outside the scope of today's webinar, but but yeah, if you want to reach out to Daniel directly, please feel free to do so. Um, so the next question is from Sonia Jose, who asks, uh, labour hire workers are generally paid by agency, so do we need to confer with the agent about this breakdown of a specific rate? Well, I'd be very careful about making any changes until we see the precise nature of the reforms, um, because you could come into other legal risks by conferring with agency, for example, from a competition law perspective, which is not something we normally advise on um, in this firm, but there could be other issues with negotiating with external employers about pay. So I would certainly wait and see um, once we get a better idea of exactly what the reforms will take, and then from there get legal advice about what action you should take in response, because they're very, they're more, what our understanding is of the planned reforms really comes from media releases at this stage. We haven't seen the legislation. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, the next question is from you here who says, uh, I would assume that workers under labour hire agreements are their direct employer's liability. Why would a company, upon engaging someone through a labour hire agency, be concerned or liable for their pay structure? I think this one, again, is you'd need to look about whether there's any cause for concern um, or and whether there's any liability once we see the precise nature of the reforms, because they're very aspirational at this stage, I should say, for lack of a better word. Um, all we've seen really is in media releases. So we'll be watching this space closely. And I'm sure you'll be hearing from us either via articles on our website or another presentation sometime this year, maybe um, in relation to this issue, once we know more. Okay. Um, and the uh, Sonia also asks, as I understand, rostered casual staff are entitled to FDVL. So wouldn't that be just their ordinary rate of pay or family divide, uh, domestic violence leave? As a matter of logic, I want to say yes, um, but we'd, we'd need to have a closer look just because it was outside the scope of today's presentation. Happy to have a closer look, though, if you've got a specific um, need for legal advice. Uh, okay, Alan, Alana asked, to add to the family domestic violent leave and casuals question, I would assume if DV leave payable would be only to cover hours scheduled for the casual or, sorry, for the day that I've leave requested, that is not an average daily uh, dollars amount uh, the casual earns. Hmm. So maybe I should repeat that question. To add to the, the family domestic violence leave uh, and casual's question, I would assume a family domestic violence leave payable would be only to cover our schedule for the casual for the days of leave requested. That is not an average daily dollar amount that the casual earns. I would say from a matter of common sense, if the casual employee wasn't rostered on that day, then they probably couldn't request leave for a day that they weren't rostered for. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, uh, Peter's jumped in with an answer there. Uh, that's, so look, whilst we're waiting for a few more questions, I thought what I might do is just um, 
tell everyone and take this opportunity to let you know about WSBC's upcoming business leader lunch, which is on the 16th of March. Um, it features a, a keynote address by uh, a speaker who is a multi-award winning speaker. Um, and it, 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 he's going to cover a very interesting topic given the current status of, of uncertainty that there is around uh, right now. Um, so the, the speaker is a fellow by the name of Michael McQueen, and he is a, a trend forecaster and a best-selling author as well. His presentation on preparing uh, for what now for what's next, how to thrive in an age of uncertainty is one that you don't want to miss. Attendees will also have the opportunity to connect with over 200 business leaders who are already registered to attend. So for more information on that, please go to wsbc.org.au. Um, now let's go back to the questions. Uh, there's questions in the Q&A box. So one's from Nicole. Uh, regarding labour hire pay rate alignment with host employer remuneration, is this on the base? Sorry, is this based on certain time frames with the host employer that they would be entitled? They also receive a twenty five percent casual loading on top of the award. Generally, we pay against the modern clerical award. Hmm. That's and I, again, I think I think that's another one we need to have a closer look at once we know. What the reforms are and what they require in that space um because very limited information known about the changes at this stage <clears throat> okay and michelle woodhouse asks will wage theft apply to employees as well as employers particularly relevant with employees working from home i assume this means where an employee has not been working while rostered to work i, I think that, i think that's the intent of the question daniel I think that would be a different issue. That would be more down a disciplinary path and having a look at what types of deductions an employer can make. And there are restrictions on that under the Fair Work Act. So I think wage theft, as is defined, and we did use quotation marks because there's no real, uh, this probably demonstrates my point, there's no real consistent definition of it. Um, I think the wage theft reforms will really apply to employers underpaying employees, potentially. So... For the other issue that you mentioned, it's most likely a disciplinary issue and potentially looking at whether deductions can be made. Okay. And um, Alana asks, uh, when do you think gig, the gig economy issue, wage rates will be looked at by the Fair Work Commission? When the legislation is passed. So whether that gives, we don't know whether it's going to give jurisdiction for the Federal Commission to look at that issue, whether it's going to go to the federal court instead. It just depends on legislation. Yeah, but we, that's right. We haven't seen the legislation yet, so we can't really tell where that might end up being determined. Um, I thought I'd mention one of the questions we, we often receive, especially in recent times, about the pay secrecy clause issue. Um, a lot of the, I think a lot of the focus has been on employment contracts. Um, and one of the questions we, we've been asked is whether pay, whether policies themselves can still include pay secrecy clauses, you know, employment policies or deeds when an employee is departing from their employment. And I think our response has generally been um, that if the contract itself, if the employment contract itself can't include policy, pay secrecy clauses, then it's safe to say that the policies as well need to be looked at, um, as well as you know any deeds that you're using. So you can't really be um, prohibiting employees from sharing their pay via third party means like that. So I think that's the answer to that question. It's a very popular one that we get. Um, and you hear um, ask this question, it is clear that the reforms are quite unfair to all employers and weakens, if not diminishes, the motive to grow. What potential moves can be in place to challenge some of the unfair reforms, Daniel? I mean, usually with reforms of this nature, there's consultation periods and the like. I understand that um, the government has been meeting with select employers about the changes already. So, um, and that usually gets broadened out to most people. So I've, I've personally um, made submissions about reforms, not in this context, but in a different context. It's it's something that's open to the public. So you can do it through, you know, if you're a young lawyer, you can do it through your young lawyer society, or if you're 
if you're part of another organization or even on a personal level, you can make those submissions and and help shape the reforms before they come about because it's better to, again, be proactive about these things. Um, and then once we see what the draft legislation is, we'll be better able to make those sorts of submissions. And then once the legislation's in place, see what rights are available under it and move from there. Okay. Yeah, look, these these are pretty significant changes to the law and um, particularly that obligation, Daniel, for um, employers to, having a positive obligation now to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, that's, I think, going to be a very challenging reform for businesses to, to deal with, um, given that, um, you know, we, we it's framed in terms of taking all reasonable steps to prevent, and but now there's a positive obligation, of course, to then make sure that they've got records of what the business has been doing mm -hmm. to prevent um, and those re or, or evidence of those reasonable steps, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that is not necessarily or well, hasn't necessarily been the case in every business um, um, up until now. I wholeheartedly agree. It's 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 a difficult one, um, and I guess it's it just goes to show that employers need to be aware of these issues um, because there, there are reforms coming and there have been reforms already and it's it's a lot to take in. So it's better to be informed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sonia, Jose asks another question. Um, uh, if the EA pre-December 22 employment agreement uh, does not specifically mention pay secrecy, could pay information be generally classified confidential information if the employer has verbally instructed the employee to keep the information confidential? I would need to look, that seems like it's very specific. I'd need to look at the specific EA before I can give an informed response, but I would say at a general level, um, that seems to be contrary to the spirit of the reforms. So I think it goes back to what I mentioned earlier about what the types of questions we're receiving. Um, about this pay secrecy reform, and that is you should, given that there don't seem to be any exceptions to this rule, you should assume that whether it's in the employment contract, whether it's in another document, if the effect of it is to prohibit employees from sharing or not sharing their pay information, then I would say it's safe to assume that that won't be allowed. Um, but we need to take a closer look at the particular EA. Yeah, and and the basis, Daniel, um, at least my understanding for the introduction of those um, prohibitions against pay secrecy clauses was to try the government trying to uh, narrow the gender pay gap, um, and I think that was the motivation. I my personally don't know whether that is likely to achieve that end, and I think a lot of um, a lot of businesses and 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 advisors take the same view that that you know this is not quite the way to achieve that so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the longer term i agree it will be interesting to watch and i think another thing will be interesting to watch is what happens if an employee for example misrepresents their pay to another colleague and that causes you know some workplace consternation what happens then um so that's interesting to interesting space to watch i think it out of all the reforms I've mentioned, it's probably the least contentious one. It's still contentious by some employers, but um, I would say definitely the sexual harassment changes are, are pretty huge um, and the labour hire changes as well. Yeah. And on that pay secrecy, it, of course, it's not it's not a positive obligation. So an employee, if they don't want to share that information, they don't have to. Um, but it just means that employers can't prevent them from, from sharing that information. I think that's critical for, for, for employers to understand. I agree. It's That definitely should be, it goes without saying that um, you don't need to positively, positively tell employees that they're allowed to, um, unless, of course, you've got one of those older contracts which you varied after 7 December last year. Um, you don't need to positively be encouraging it, but I think transparency is probably better just to be part of the conversation. Well, um, um, I don't think there's any further questions at the moment, Daniel. Um, 
So if there are no further questions, any further questions? No, it looks like it. That's it. So Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time today. It is a very important subject for every business. We all have employees. We all need to understand what the rules are that we must play by. So I want to thank you for giving us such a great presentation today. Uh, and thank Matthew Svolbig for supporting this web webinar as well. Um, finally, I also want to thank you, our members and guests, uh, for your attendance today and your ongoing support. We're going to uh, sign off now. Um, thanks once again. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you all. Thanks, Daniel.